I'm a child of the motherland destined, so I understand. I'm the number one on the top, and I got the hand. My ancestors were great, I got no other plans than to follow their paths. I am an African child. Hi, my name is Kwaku. I work across music and global African history, and I'm part of BTWSC, a pan London voluntary organization, and the lead for the African or Black Question, which is focused on African identity. When we heard of the UN's initiative called ITPAD, International Decade for People of African Descent, we embraced it. In fact, we've attached their logo to the BT BTWSC logo and we've delivered ITPAD programs both in London and Accra. The decade is almost over. So when we heard that the Permanent Forum on People of African Descent were convening 5th December to 8th December, we decided to convene a meeting prior to that so that some of the members could hear what the African community had to say and some of the ITPAD advocates who've been doing this thing since 2015. Sadly, I saw a document with about 100 ITPAD organizations, but when I tried contacting them, I noticed that many of them were out of business. When you go online and you go to Twitter, you see a few handles with ITPAD in there, but again, most of them are not active. It's always a problem of finance or human resources, but nevertheless, there are organizations doing the ITPAD work across the nation indeed internationally. So we reached out to uh, international bodies to give us country reports or to give us aspects of ITPAD work that they're doing. We're glad to say that we've got at least one UN organization which is UNESCO represented and the Pendant Forum has one person represented. It should have been two, but nevertheless, we, we, we had one. So this is a summary of what went on on 3rd December in our ITPAD 2022 Zoom conference. Enjoy. Oh, we do start off with some music because there's a lot of talk. So we've got a DJ called Tipper Irie. The moment I heard this new track called I'm an African, I just had to have it on board. Thankfully, he gave us permission and his blessing for us to use his video. We've got a strand called Music for Courses, which we use to speak to issues, whether gun crime, history, uh, f fair trade, we've done it all. It features a rapper called Kimber. So what we did was that we've, done, we've got a, a huge catalog. So we took the essence of some of these songs and we put it together in something called the Itpad Medley. Enjoy. And you know I know where I'm from. Tipper Irie. OBF ah, I'm missing say I'm a black man I'm an African and my parents are Jamaican and I grew up in a London so you know I know where I'm coming from I'm a black man I'm an African and my parents are Jamaican and I grew up in a London so you know I know where I'm coming from, I know where I'm coming from, I know where I'm going in some positive energy. I keep on showing respect myself, respect my roots, and respect my ancestors. I can't forget Marcus Gavin, Malcolm X, and Robert Nesta. Teach us to educate our sisters and our brother. Teach us to unify and support one another. One God, one aim, and one destiny. How that how we want in our community. So, well, I'm a black man, I'm an African. I'm my parents, I'm Jamaican, and we grew up in a London, so you know I know where I'm coming from. This is the ITPAD Medley. ITPAD is the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent 2015 to 2024 initiative to globally redress the prejudice, discrimination, and Afrophobia faced by African peoples, including the marginalization of their histories and contributions to society, wherever they may be, from Ghana to India, Jamaica to Papua New Guinea, Brazil to Zimbabwe, Barbados to Nigeria, the U.S. to Iraq, Sweden to Costa Rica, 
or Haiti to the kingdom of the Netherlands. I'm a child of the motherland, destined so I understand. I'm the low on the top and not the underhand. My ancestors were great, I got no other plans than to follow their paths. I am an African child of the motherland, destined so I understand. I'm the low on the top and not the underhand. My ancestors were great, I got no other plans than to follow their paths. I am an African. I'm a child of a great place, my bloodline got a great faith. So it's time that minds take shape in the form of those who went before me, blazing history's pages with legacies of glory. Marcus Garvey, the Jamaican orator, who led millions through races, streets, and corridors, determined for equality, keys for any door, economic empowerment so blacks are never poor. He's one of many, we'll look at several more, so let's rewind, go back in time a bit further, and take a look at them Hotep, an avid learner, an architect, an engineer, and a physician, a philosopher as well, with poetic intuitions, knowledge without restrictions to others' measures. Applying the brilliant mind to various elements Speech refined, life defined by black intelligence I'm a child of the motherland, destined so I understand I'm the low on the top and not the other hand My ancestors were great, I got no other plans than to follow them What's that? Is that the same song? I think it is Wow There's a broker record playing same song on repeat. Elvis to Ed Sheeran, featured over beats of African origin. Same success never reached. The tables with record labels originators can't eat. There's a broker record playing same song on repeat. Josh Stone, Amy Winehouse, featured over beats of African origin. Same success never reached. The tables with record labels originators can't eat. It's plain to see. But to some, unclear, hidden from weaker eyes behind a glossy veneer. The foundations of this building that's been standing up for years is unkept in spite of house and billions of careers. Now an elephant's in the room. Some say, does it exist? Well, some people can't breathe. Others are getting rich, profiting off the ivory and every square inch of this natural resource to a disproportionate extent. Cultural capital sounds foreign, so what is it? Can it be quantified, measured by any distance? You can if you look at record sales and the listings of billionaires that profit off the sounds and the interest of British African music, changing how people listen. From Sam Coleridge to Bev Knight, there's been misgivings. But will that change? Some explain they got intentions, but the industry at large would exclaim it's too expensive. There's a broker record playing same song on repeat. Elvis to Ed Sheeran. It's impossible to miss the indelible influence reggae music has had on the world. However, many are unaware of the British African and British contribution to that influence. Thankfully, the reggae tree in Halston is where Brent has established the capital of reggae in Britain. Forced migration formed a vibration Oppressed Africans across some torn nations Made foreigners ass what in torn nations Is this new sound shutting down our stations US R&B Calypso and jazz Over 9B drums together was like gas To burn Babylonian empires to ash The history of reggae is a glorious past The warrior staff to part seas curious grass A global attention as enormous as math Birthed in blood baths of racial oppression Africa to Jamaica the sound made a progression Britain now the stepping stone for this procession Champion sound to earn pounds from investing Bass drums, bass hums became a weapon the guitar licks, drums, kicks, horn sections, halls then to Lewisham, Brit stepping, mods the skinheads, rockers found affection in this new sound of Jamaican perfection. Untapped resource, Caribbean selection. The stage now set in country's appetite wet. London, a centerpiece for the feast on its fresh. Musical cuisine, Britain is like a chef, a melting pot where great creators could express. In Hackney, we have a, a building um, which we uh, named the IPAD Centre. It was done for many reasons, um, mostly to keep the message of IPAD in the consciousness 
of all those who have forgotten about it. And uh, that was really important because um, I was just looking at the uh, Open Democracy letter, the open letter that was sent in 2016. Um, and just remembering that the British government admitted to not actually having any plans to recognize um, the, the decade. And um, they stay true to their words. I'm a child of the motherland destined, so I understand. I belong on the top and not the under end. My ancestors were great, I got no other plans than to follow their paths. I am an African child of the motherland destined, so I understand. I'm alone on the top and not the under end. So having a community space, which we named it PAD, and that's we, we have the principles and the values on there, and we are quite strict about the projects that are able to take place in there must be of benefit to people of African heritage, um, is our way of keeping it going. And we intend to keep going even after 2024. We need to be quite specific, and we have a year to do this. We know the problems are there. That's what we keep getting told and we keep getting triggered by that. But now we need to know and identify, and we have a year to do this, a specific system to structural violence. I'm not saying we don't support individual cases. I'm moving away from individual cases for a little while until I can get my, my center back. But we need to find out exactly what are those lines that are causing these problems that are invisible. And then I would finally say that in year two, as we come to the end of IPAD, when we are going to make noise to say it's coming to the end, we're going to say, this is what needs to happen. And to solve it, we need to identify, and I'm gonna be quite clear here, revolutionary solutions. We have been tricked and pushed back by what I call progressiveness. This is where it's piecemeal changes. 
And what happens is that we also start to compromise because we don't expect things to be eradicated. We don't expect those revolutionary changes. Well, that's clear that some of those revolution aspirations won't happen. But if we don't start from a high benchmark of what we expect and what we demand and what we want and what we are going to make happen, then what happens, we start from this middling compromise position. And then after the trading, after the push and throw, we end up somewhere down there. Then we end up going around in a circle and this decade will mean absolutely nothing. So we need to be bolder. We need to be clear. We, 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 you know, we, we cannot, we don't have the time to mess around with people who are compromising every day for their own political and economic gain. We, we have to be clear about what are the revolutionary solutions. And that's why I say that next year is about identifying wherever we are, whatever. I work in universities. So I'll be looking at every single policy that messes up our people in the university and writing them down. And then the next year, what needs to go, what needs to change? It's a very straight system. So this is what I would say that I have learned over the decade. We're not at the end, and I think we have two years left and what we can do. Uh, the Ed Pedestan too is a small game. We have a space to organize. Um, thank you for raising it, Kwaku. And just like I'll say to everyone else, if anyone wants to come to Hackney or is in London and needs a space to organize, needs a space just to theorize or just to be, just to exhale, just to get away from white supremacy, drop me an email, I'll pass it on to one of our colleagues and we'll just sit down and coach. We did this okay. this weekend. So yeah, I'll leave it there. And that's not, and that's not to say other communities don't have the same issues of race structure racism, they do. But we know from our history of enslavement that it's enduring, it's ongoing, and that's why we have to be very distinctive. So the question we need to ask ourselves, how, what can we do in the next two years to have an educational programme to inform the community to using the word Afrophobia or anti-Blackness and to start lobbying politicians and, and, and agencies like the NHS, local government, to start using this to, to, to explicitly describe the impact of structural racism and the, history, and the legacy of enslavement on our mind, bodies and soul. That is a challenge we've got over the next two years to do that. And I know in the early days of when iPad was first established here in the UK, there were big debates about language. There was big debates about how you campaign. And unfortunately, we didn't really come together in an effective way because we've got to mobilise the community. It's all very good as activists. We're talking to ourselves. We've got to talk to the community to be a part of this process because they are, they are experiencing Afrophobia every day. We need to help them to articulate this in the way so when their child's been excluded from school, they will say Afrophobia. When they are being discriminated in access and health and social care services, they use the word Afrophobia. When they're still being stopped by the, by the police or wrongfully arrested, we use Afrophobia. When someone's been pre uh, preventing around, um, their career development or promotion at work, we use Afrophobia. So we need to think of ways of doing that. We need to think of organisations to do this. We need to think of ways of developing some sort of campaign to land this over the next two years. And I think the other thing that we can do, and, and I've heard, I don't know how true this is, I've been hearing that the, 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 the decade, there's rumours that the decade might be extended for another five, 10 years. I don't know how true that is. I mean, if that happens, then that will be useful and, and very helpful. But in the UK context, it's unfortunate that during the period of the decade, it's been, we've had the most right-wing uh, government in power in Britain, which has made it very difficult for them to even acknowledge racism, never least uh, Afrophobia. You know, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, so we need to think of ways how we strategize against that. And I think more and more people recognize this, this, um, this anti-Blackness Afrophobia. I think Meghan Markle, uh, what she went through uh, with the royal family, and more recently, um, and Gozi Fulani, what she went through recently, a few days ago, realised that the institutions like the Royal Family and other key institutions like corporates, banks, um, NHS, 
there's countless examples. We need to encourage people to start using this word Afrophobia. I mean, the headline should have been in the mainstream media. Uh, instead of saying charity boss um, being discriminated by a woman who was of a certain age, which is forgetful. So this is an example of Afrophobia. That would have been a really fantastic conversation. We could have a national debate on that. And the final bit, just to add to the decade, is we have to, we have to admit that the average person of African heritage in the UK are not familiar with the decade. I know Brother Kwaku has organized quite a few events over the years used in the branding of the decade. I've done, uh, I've done, I've done some similar events used in the branding, but not many organizations have used the logo, the branding, explain the concepts and the ideas why there's a decade. So we still got, to, so we need to think of how we've got two more years left what more we can do on that front. I'll stop there. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Kwaku. And uh, I, I really want to uh, express uh, our gratitude to Kwaku and BTWSC African History uh, for this uh, for your uh, initiative and uh, for the opportunity that you're giving us to reflect and on and to recognize uh, the contribution uh, of the international uh, decade for people of African descent to the rich cultures, heritage, and achievements of people of African descent. So. Uh, this African uh, community-led uh, forum uh, ensures that we do not close uh, this chapter uh, without a concrete and a comprehensive initiative that will strengthen the protection, the safeguarding, and the promotion of the rich and uh, invaluable culture of uh, Afro-descendant people. Uh, uh, the decade, the decade was. Uh, was and still a unique platform really that uh, emphasizes the important contribution made by people of African descent to every society and promotes concrete measure to stop discrimination and promote their full inclusion. So I was just quoting actually uh, Madame Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for uh, Human Rights. Uh, OHCHR was one of uh, uh, the key uh, agency, UN agencies, alongside UNESCO, UNFPA, and, uh, and uh, UNDP and others working and, and, and supporting uh, the member states in the implementation of this decade. It is, from the UN perspective, it is important to remind to this fora today that any initiatives taken, approved at the UN level, then the implementation rely on the people, on the citizen, and of course of the member states when they are to come on the forum, on the formal fora to report on the implementation and, and uh, on, on their different uh, cases. Uh, it is uh, imperative in that regard that we accelerate the implementation of international commitments to advance the rights of people of African descent for their recognition, justice, and development. Throughout our history, Africans and people of African descent have inspired the world through powerful economic, social, political, and cultural contribution for humanity. While such achievements certainly deserve to be acknowledged, the appreciation for African and Afro-descendant culture has regrettably been minimal. So it's encouraging to note that uh, this forum can review achievements and existing challenges to the realization of the rights of people of African descent, as well as assessing the practical gains that can be made uh, during the last uh, two years uh, of the decades. One of the key steps that, uh, steps that remains to be taken is the integration, integration of African history 
and culture into education. This was mentioned by the previous uh, speakers, the education. Everything starts with the education. Our children, and not only our children, the adults, the youth, need to be talked about the history of African and the diaspora, the rich and diverse shared heritage of the African people in the continent and across the diaspora and unlearned misconception and stereotypes about Africa and its diaspora. So this is how UNESCO, the United Nations Organization Chart of Education, Science, Culture, uh, we have a flagship program uh, called the General History of Africa. Uh, and uh, through that program, UNESCO support African countries in reclaiming ownership over the narration of their own history and reviving their cultural identities to strengthen a shared aspiration to achieve African unity. And uh, this is in this regard that uh, in uh, 2009, uh, UNESCO launched the pedagogical use of the general history of Africa to adapt the content of the volumes of the general history of Africa to school education. And we really strongly encourage, of course, African countries, African and Afro-descendant uh, 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 entities, wherever they are, to do every possible to incorporate these tools into the national uh, curricula. Without it, we could never overcome. Without uh, integrating in the education, we could not uh, overcome. And uh, this is what we're doing here in Ghana. In the case of Ghana, we are uh, in our dialogue with the Minister of Education and the uh, Minister of Culture uh, and the uh, Institute of African Studies. We are supporting uh, the, the institution in this regard. But I must confess that there is still a big gap in achieving that critical result, ensuring that this history, the key regional history is there uh, 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 for the learners, for the teachers and in the education spaces. On the cultural side, uh, you know, UNESCO has the heritage uh, program, uh, the World Heritage, uh, promoting the heritage in all countries. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, uh, and uh, Ghana, you know, for its critical uh, 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 place, uh, is the host of uh, uh, the witnesses of uh, uh, the transatlantic slave trade through, through the fort and castles, uh, which are world uh, uh, heritage. It's a serial world heritage all along uh, the shore, which offers a unique opportunity to learn about the African and Afro-descendant history. And uh, UNESCO in this regard, of course, support the member states. We do at every possible, but we cannot replace the citizen and the countries. We remind countries of the global uh, agenda of their commitment, and then they have to implement. And of course, with the support of the civil societies and uh, in a dialogue, in a constant dialogue with the diaspora. UNESCO has this program the Roots of the Enslaved People Project. It is interesting, as I was uh, uh, following your conversation on the Afrophobia and the, and the temp. You know, the program, the Roots of Enslaved People's Project, initially it was called the Roots of Slaved uh, People's Project, the Roots of Slaved People, and it's thanks to the, uh, the discussion the, 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 the uh, contribution of the civil societies and that the scientific name of the project was changed last year and now becomes the roots of enslaved people's project because we don't, uh, 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 you don't birth uh, a slave, you become. And uh, this project, uh, it is uh, aiming to demonstrate why and how exploring the tragedy can help us to establish the link between a tragic past, a complex uh, present, and the future to be created together. And the project has been contributing to the production of innovative knowledge, development of high 
level scientific networks and the support of memory initiative on the time of slavery, its, its abolition and the resistance uh, it generated, as well as highlighting the issues of racism and ways to deal with it. And there again, it uh, uh, depends on you, the, the citizens, the civil societies, the intellectual platform to own this project in each country so that uh, it be there it be uh, a, a powerful platform uh, for this uh, for this thematic we must not forget the key role also of the intangible cultural heritage in the transmission of african and afro descendant history cultural heritage is not just about the physical aspect of culture uh, such as the artifacts and buildings but it's also about the traditional representation practices and living expressions of groups and communities. So this is how uh, uh, the music reggae was recognized recently and uh, by, by Jamaica as a world uh, uh, intangible cultural, a world intangible cultural heritage. And this is a way also, and I, we could say that all these recognitions were done during the time of the decade also, and, and uh, uh, even not being a direct uh, um, implementation on, on, of, of one of uh, the components, it uh, contributes and it will feed uh, 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 the, 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 the space. So, uh, and as part of the shared heritage uh, among countries, we really want to take this opportunity to encourage uh, also the return, the restitution and the reparation of uh, African artifacts, uh, since they are intrinsically linked to the culture and identity uh, of, of the people they were taken uh, illicitly. Uh, on the, uh, I would like to take the, the, the opportunity also to recognize how uh, some of uh, Ghana's achievements in the advancements of the rights of the Afro-descendant people. Last uh, uh, January 24, uh, UNESCO and UNFPA together with the governments and partners and other key stakeholders, uh, um, such as Ghana Culture Forum here, uh, a very vibrant and dynamic platform uh, 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 here in Ghana and the Panafest, uh, they hosted the, the, uh, the global edition of the World Day of African and Afro-Descendant Culture, which is a new day, which was uh, established during that decade. Uh, uh, you are also aware that uh, an important other international day, the uh, day of uh, the International Day for Afro-Descendant, to be celebrated now every uh, August 31. Uh, is also uh, uh, a result, I would say, of the dynamic uh, which was uh, 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 created uh, within this uh, decade. But those international day are opportunities for all of us to come all together. Uh, the five region, the six region, as you are aware, uh, the, the the diaspora is the six region recognized by Africa Union to celebrate consistently these uh, issues, these wealth, but to talk about the challenges that we are, uh, uh, the continent and the diaspora are, uh, are, are, are sharing together. So Kwaku, I think I spoke a lot, but uh, yes, yeah. uh, um, uh, before, before ending, before ending, yes, your subject was about the decade. The decade, of course, it's a UN decision. And as I reminded, a UN decision calls on, on member states and its citizens to implement it. They are accountable. Also, we are all accountable of the implementation. So it's good to come and see what we have done. Have we done enough? Is it enough? And then if we want to do another one or to shape it differently, it is in the hand of the member states individually or on common platform through regional uh, uh, bodies such as Africa Union and others. And I wanted to share with you, uh, I don't know if all of you here present, are you aware of the new Africa Union decade starting from 2021 to 2031 on the Afro, on the diaspora and 
de, uh, de, uh, uh, de African roots, it's called. Uh, are you aware of this? It's an African Union uh, decade they adopted in uh, 2021. So how is a platform to, uh, to extend this dialogue also? As I'm sure you all know, uh, the Permanent Forum of People of African Descent is having its first session in Geneva next week from Monday to Thursday uh, next week. And, and I'm indeed one of the, the 10 members of the forum. Uh, I'm also its, its first rapporteur, so I will be the one that will be drafting the, the conclusions and the recommendations to come out of, of the, the first uh, session. And this is already looking to be a, a big forum. Uh, we have about 1,000 um, civil society that has registered. Uh, some, of, some civil society will participate online. Uh, most uh, will be in Geneva. So it looks like it's going to be a very well attended uh, meeting. The second session will be held in New York City next year from the 30th of May until the uh, 2nd of June. Please do go to the, uh, our website and read about the first session. Uh, I, I, you know, I think you, I hope you will agree with, with me that it is a quite a strong program, uh, including systemic racism, reparatory justice, climate justice, uh, and, and the declaration and, and intersectionality is on there uh, also. Um, it's going to be live streamed on UN Web TV. So you should be able to go uh, to UN Web TV uh, on Monday and, and see it live streamed. Monday is going to be the opening with an opening ceremony in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we're going to be discussing the first uh, topic of the session, which is systemic racism. As I'm sure you all know also, uh, one of the central aspects of, of the mandate of the forum is to contribute to a UN declaration on the human rights of people of African descent. And uh, this declaration, uh, the General Assembly has already uh, agreed or decided is going to be a first step towards a binding agreement. That is to say, is going to be a first step towards an international convention, an international, international law. Um, and so this is a big deal. And this is an instrument that will be, uh, you know, of, of great importance for people of African descent across the world uh, in the future. And this forum uh, in general is a historic opportunity. Uh, as you all know, who know your Pan-African history, uh, this has been a, a, a long time, um, a long time ambition and, and goal of, of uh, Pan-African uh, movements, uh, including the, the Pan-African conferences that were held in, in Europe 1900, between 1900 and 1945. And also, uh, for instance, Malcolm X ambitions towards the end of his life, and that is to give people of African descent a presence and a forum at the United Nations to be able to address the human rights of people of African descent across the world. We have this now, we have this now. So this is a historic opportunity and it will become as strong and powerful as we choose to make it. So that's, that's it from, from me. Thank you if you have any questions. No, it's not, it's, it's not enough, uh, Brother Michael. Now <laughs> tell us a bit, this is supposed to be a global thing. So tell us a bit about what, what has been happening in Sweden since 2015 in terms of IPAD activities. You were very active in, in the UK for a little while when you're based here in terms of getting the IPAD Coalition UK together. Uh, Brother CJ, actually Brother CJ will be making a presentation on, on that but you are back in Sweden. We need to have an idea of what has been happening in Sweden, please. Okay, very good, excellent. So um, yes, as you all may know, um, 
Sweden, along with uh, many other, most other European countries, is is has taken an an ultra nationalist uh, turn uh, politically. Uh, the second largest political party in Sweden these days is is the Sweden Democrats with roots in neo Nazism, uh, and uh, the Sweden Democrats is now the leading party in a right wing coalition government. Uh, so uh, you know. Um, Times times are changing somewhat when it comes to the the domestic politics of Sweden and also its its international uh, politics. Now, uh, Sweden has never, uh, as most European countries, has never recognized the international decade for for people of African uh, descent. Never, never uh, in terms of and when I mean recognizing it, it has never uh, implemented uh, it. Um, now that said, uh, you know, of course, um, people like my, myself and others, we have advocated for the decade both in Sweden, but most um, importantly, perhaps, or, or more prominently at, at the United Nations level. Uh, and there has been many, uh, much more success in implementing the decade at the UN level than at the domestic levels. and. As far as I'm concerned, for the rest of the two years, we should all focus on the UN uh, level uh, when it comes to the decade. And when we call for a second decade, which I think we should, we should also make that decade focus more on further institutionalizing the human rights of people of African descent at the UN uh, level, level, including around the declaration, uh, and, and other um, you know, recommendations that could be made. So for instance, uh, instituting, uh, institutionalizing a UN observatory on systemic racism against people of African descent and, and, and other, other things. That, that would be my recommendation uh, regarding the, the remainder of the decade and, and, and a possible uh, second uh, decade. Here in Sweden, I am, among other things, a board member of Black Lives Matter Sweden. And, uh, you know, we do a lot of work uh, here in Sweden, uh, including uh, being in dialogue with the previous government. We have uh, not been in dialogue with the current government yet, and, and uh, we uh, do not expect to ever be in dialogue with this, this government. Uh, and, uh, you know, you all might not know because they are uh, there are unfortunately few African descendant activists in Sweden that, that are prominent internationally. Uh, most of the Afro descendant activists are mostly prominent domestically. There are some exceptions. You all might, will probably know of uh, uh, Malcolm Mamadou Yalo from Gambia, who is uh, a Gambian Swede and a member of parliament for the left party and was uh, previously the second vice chair of the European Network Against Racism and is also the special rapporteur on, on I believe the special rapporteur on racism for the European Council, I think, or something like this. Uh, yes, but uh, we have uh, uh, several prominent organizations, African descendant organizations in Sweden, maybe the most, the two most, the three most prominent ones are Black Lives Matter Sweden that I'm a board member of, the National Association of Afro-Swedes, and the Pan-African Movement for Justice, which Yalo uh, uh, founded uh, and which is based in, in Malmö, which is, by the way, 10 minutes away by train from Lund, where I'm based. And I, I grew up in Malmö. <laughs> so, right. Yes. I am I'm only aware of one African M M M MP, which is uh, Jalo. So, can you tell us, uh, and obviously he comes from the, uh, the a background of a activism. In mm -hmm. fact, the first time I heard about Afrophobia, then the EU spells it for an O, Afrophobia. Mm -hmm. We are campaigning mm -hmm. that we use I to link it more mm -hmm. with Africa. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. the first time I heard an EU discussion of Afrophobia, Jalo mm -hmm. uh, was on, on, on that panel. Can mm -hmm. you tell me what he in particular is doing to push for the impact agenda and also so Jalo and also one particular act uh concrete thing that 
one of the civil society organizations in Sweden has done in furthering the ITPAD agenda? Okay, so um, yes, I would say, you know, among the most prominent um, African descendant activists in Sweden is, um, is Kitimwa Sabuni, uh, who was born in Sweden with parents from the Congo. Uh, I, you know, it, personally, I would make him number one. And it was his, his uncle and his father that founded the National Association of Afro Swedes back in 1990. And it was them that established the term Afro Swedes, which is still uh, recognized as a collective term uh, in, in, in Sweden. Although you have some, some younger people that prefer the term African Swedes. Uh, and you know, and, and this conversation about Afro and African and so on is also uh, going on in, in Sweden, although, uh, you know, um, people like Kitimwa and I would say, I would think Yalo also, uh, you know, think that this, the term Afro-Swede and African-Swede or the term Afrophobia and Afriphobia have the same etymological roots. Is not so that Afro, the term Afro, grew out of a hairstyle or a specific uh, uh, sort of hair. It is rather that that term uh, simply means uh, people of, 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 of African descent or that are related to the continent of Africa. So, so etymologically, there's really no difference. Then, then the term Afrophobia, Kitimwa Sabuni, together with Victoria Kawesa, who is also a long-term, long-time activist, uh, they made sure that for the first time, the National Bureau on Crime uh, Prevention um, started collected, collecting Af so-called Afrophobic hate crimes since 2009. Uh, and that is thanks to them. And this is because so-called Afrophobic hate crimes are the most prevalent form of hate crimes in Sweden up until today. Since the day it has been measured up until today, more prevalent than any other hate crime on any other grounds. Uh, so, you know, uh, it, it's uh, Afrophobia is, is a pervasive problem in Sweden. Let me just give you one statistics as an example of how deep Afrophobia is in Sweden. If you are a person of African descent with a degree, a higher education degree, a, a, a university degree, you are unlikely to have a job that matches your level of education. And so, and this is true also of people of African descent that are born in the country. And so, you know, this is not, there's no other group that have this sort of statistics, you know. And so this means, this means that if you are a person of African descent, one could make the argument that is not even rational, so to speak, to pursue a higher degree because professionally is still not going to lead to a job that uh, is unlikely to lead to a job that matches your level of education. Now we're talking, of course, of averages, but you, you but, but still, you, you, you understand how, how, how serious it is. At some time, I think the forum will have to engage a bit more with the community. So outreach is an important thing. You go look at your channels. I mean, I can see Sister Judy there. She's used to it. She knows the channels and she goes to it. But there are lots of people who are not hooked into the UN. And you have to have an outreach for an organization like ours who speak to people who are not on the uh, UN radar. So that is what I want to put to you to maybe deliberate with your, your colleagues at some time. Yes, okay, in, 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 indeed, outreach is, is, is critical and, and we have just gotten started. Uh, we were, uh, you know, the forum was, uh, as members, we were, uh, uh, you know, weren't established until in March uh, and now we have in our first session less than a year later. Uh, so, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done, including outreach, also keeping in mind that, you know, we are heavily underfunded. 
and that is our, one of our priorities is to, to raise uh, funds. I, I uh, saw just a message here um, from, from uh, on our honorable uh, elder and sister, uh, Dr. Barrel Beekman uh, here about the term Afrophobia. Uh, I, I, uh, I think it was misunderstood. I don't mean to, to uh, at all uh, say that uh, Kitimwa Sabuni and, and uh, Victoria Cabeza uh, were first the first ones to coin the term Afrophobia, not at all. But in Sweden, they were the first ones to, I would say, that to, to promote the term Afrophobia. And they actually did that in a collaboration with a friend of Beekman, and, and that is Jan Lund. The three of them had a working group on Afrophobia. It is as simple as this. We have all of the resources. The presentations that have already taken place are, there isn't a word uttered that I could possibly disagree with. Putting all of these things together, having a space and a platform to connect our community in the UK, our activist community and various organizations to the structures of the UN, to the ambitions of the UN, to the principles of the UN, to the objectives of international law and morality from their original African articulation in the philosophy of Ma'at. This we can do and succeed in doing with unity, with unity. So before my battery dies, I want to go out making an appeal for unity and to say that the principles of Ma'at unite us and give us the strength to lay claim, as the brother from UNESCO was saying, to the African origin of the very foundations of the United Nations. These well, things belong to us as African people, and it is imperative that we lay claim to our heritage globally. Right. I know you're conscious about your battery, but you've made an effort to be here, and I know you've been out of the loop for a while. But maybe you can speak to some of the things that you, you would have done as part of IPA coalition and maybe the way forward at the very least. So let's have a sense of where you've come from and where you possibly hope to go in the last two years. Well, I've, I, that's, a, that's an excellent question, my brother. And I, I, what I would say is really that we have such an excellent board. We have such a wide variety of experiences and uh, skills. And it's a question of allowing all of that to come together to determine the course of action. It's not really for me to say, hey, I say we must all do this. Our, our organization is based on the determination of the way ahead collectively. I would like to see more progress made in terms of the UK recognizing the, the decade. I believe that that pressure can be properly applied and good efforts to that end have, have been made but we can redouble our efforts in these next two years. As a, as a specific thing for me personally, as with my individual academic scholar activist hat on, so to speak, I am profoundly concerned with developments at the Ma'at Community Centre in Tottenham. The centre is uh, under attack from financial organisations. There are what are classified in their conception of reality as debts being owed to them, that is the financial organizations, by the community and its representative in the form of uh, Elder Pepper Kai. And the reality is that the debt, the direction of debt is entirely the other way around. So it is a fact that the institutions that we are talking about have a relationship that goes back with our community over the course of hundreds of years. And the wealth that's been accumulated as a result of that is such that the debt should be functioning in the other way. And so I suppose the point I would like to make in that sense is that there is a campaign to be undertaken. There is an emergency at the Ma'at Centre, but it does dramatise the issues of reparations which are becoming ever more urgent in all of their different manifestations across our community and across the globe 
and the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent and the work that's already gone on by stalwarts to raise awareness and to uh, share information is such that we must now be able to come together and uh, make positive change and make everybody live up to the potential that they have within them as organizations, as institutions, as individuals, as people, as Africans, as human beings. It, it, it's really time now. It really is. And the permanent form and forum, the permanent forum is a wonderful institutional recognition of the urgency of that mission. So, Sister Judy, you've been around the Eat Path thing for quite a while. You want the people that live in the UK to go to their meetings in Geneva. I think you know the back ways of, 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 of Geneva. So, uh, you are supposed to speak, and I've forgotten what the title is, but I'm, I'm sure you, you will tell me in, in, the, in the moment. Sister Judy is supposed to say the challenges of community organizations engaging with the UN institutions. Wow, yeah, I mean, that's why you're chosen. Because even without reading your topic, I was making the point that you you've been there so many times. So please, the floor is yours. I mean, for me, one of the challenges is that the UN is vast. We hear about the negative sides of the Security Council, but we don't remember about UNESCO and the different working groups and the special rapporteurs. So it makes it very hard to engage if all you hear is the warmongering side and you don't see the other side that is can be much more open. Um, I think the UN itself is not particularly good at connecting the dots. So I think it's 2019, I was at a week long session of meetings that I think the Friday of that week was consultation on the permanent forum for people of African descent. A bit in the lead to that, we were looking at the Durban Declaration of Programme of Action, the thing, uh, SDGs, I can't remember what the S stands for, the, the development goals um, that all countries are supposed to have signed up to. Sustainable. 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 <laughs> My head went blank for a second. Yeah. Um, and we were being told that they didn't link up. But although they obviously relate to African people and people generally, they hadn't actually sat and looked at, if you're looking at this particular issue, how does it relate to this other issue? We have, in the UK, been quite successful in using the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which um, works to a particular convention. We've been able to go to the UN with a delegation um, when the government presents its report on what it's doing to fight racism, civil society then gets the opportunity to put in their response to that report and to add anything they think is missing. GAC, Global African Congress UK, has been in 2011, sorry, 2011 and 2016. In 2016, along with the Runnymede Trust and various other organizations, like the Black Police Association, Black Mental Health UK. Um, we argued that the data that was available was inadequate, that they needed to be better at ethnic monitoring. That is why we now have the race disparity audit. But the UK government will never tell you that they produced that because civil society went to the UN. The UN in their concluding observation said, we think you need to get better at this. And so we get the race disparity audit. From that same 2016, we got the David Lammy review of the criminal justice system, McGregor Smith report on, on race and employment, the mental health act that was being reviewed, had a particular stream where there was a working group looking specifically at black people, African people, and the mental health act that made recommendations that were included in the final report. There were other things as well, but those four specifically, I can track back to civil society engagement at the UN. 
it's probably one of the reasons why the government doesn't tell us about these UN streams and the things that people can get involved in, because the UN will tell the government what we are telling them. They, they recognise lived experience long before the term was being used. And the government doesn't like being embarrassed in public. So if the UN tells them something, they will try and do something about it, where they will try and ignore civil society. Another issue in getting involved in the UN is the late notice. You get told maybe a week beforehand that there's this event happening in Geneva or New York, but most of us have lives outside of the UN work. Even if we had the money, the ability to drop everything and get flights and accommodation and physically take a week out effectively to go to an event is near impossible. We're trying to get them to actually have things on Zoom so that people don't have to physically be there, that people can join from wherever they are in the world. But it does seem like they have to be reminded to use Zoom. So you might see I've put in the chat that the permanent forum is next week. Some of us are actually going to be there. Some have arrived already from the sounds of it. But if people had known they could join by Zoom, far more would have joined, I'm sure. They've put a deadline of the 1st of December for registration but if it's going to be on Zoom why does there need to be a deadline it should be open to anybody so that if they can only make one day out of the five make that one day be able to contribute and hear what's going on um, language is another barrier I think the UN works in about five different languages and I'm not going to remember them all but English Spanish French, a, a, some of those languages. We're here now using English, but I'm conscious that not everybody on this call has English as a first language and may not be confident to use the English. There has to be a means of supporting communities to be able to speak in whichever language they want to and have it interpreted for others with other language needs. The um, working group for ex of experts, people of African descent is coming to the UK in January. There was a call for information for them to work out who they want to see when they come. You had to reply in English. Yes, they're coming to the UK, but even in England, not everybody in the UK speaks English and would be comfortable with putting that kind of information out in English. Um, language in a wider sense. We've had a discussion here about Afrophobia and spelling it with an I and why some spell it with an I. We haven't had the conversation about using the term people of African descent. Some of us struggle with that because at the end of the day, we are African. To say that somebody is of descent, well, Chinese people aren't talked about being Chinese descent. You don't talk about Indian people being of Indian descent. Why is it only Africans that people talk about as being of some descent, like we're removed from the source and so we're so somehow different? And if it's people of African descent, but you're actually born on the continent, living on the continent, does that mean that we're not talking about them? That is what some people think. So we do have to look at the language that gets used. We do have now the Permanent Forum for People of African Descent. They have a number of working groups. I think Elsie will be able to explain them better than me because I know she's involved in at least one of them. That gives us an opportunity to get engaged and see what is going on and how we can share our information, share our experiences. The more I, I engage in international events, the same issues around stop and search and discrimination in education and the criminal justice system and housing. We're dealing with multinational companies, we're dealing with governments that work together, so we shouldn't be surprised maybe that we're facing the same forms of discrimination. So we, as Toyin, I think it was saying, need to come together better that means we have to set aside our differences. 
we have to look at the fact we are African people working for African people and that we may not always agree on everything, but if we can agree on that as our founding principle and our guiding principle, then we have to set aside ego and jealousies and whatever else it is that can get in the way of our working together and look at what we can do for the benefit of our communities at a UN level and otherwise. I will leave it at that. I think that this uh, meeting is very important. And for me, for my side, I hope that um, at, uh, at the long run, after uh, at the end, that you can put some key points that we can bring to uh, Geneva next week. So what I realized is that after the, the Durban Declaration, there was the 9-11 uh, uh, issue, global issue, and that is that a lot of people forget that at that meeting, three uh, after two world conference, the third uh, a world conference, the United Nations declare the transatlantic slave trade, slavery and colonialism, apartheid as a crime against humanity. And the, 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 the UN decade for people of every uh, can descent is nothing else then a, a new instrument, a mechanism to make sure that political will will be to implement the Durban Declaration and the program of action. As we know, after 2001, we didn't see actions uh, 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 regarding national action plans in, in various countries. It, after the, uh, towards the, the Durban Review, we have seen the European Union, the USA, Canada, Australia, Syria, and some other allies. We have seen them that they, we have noticed that they boycott the Durban Review 2009. And luckily in article one of the, of the, of the outcome document of the, of the Durban Review, we have seen in article uh, one, that the DDPA was, uh, was uh, recognized, was reaffirmed. So after this high level panel, 2010, you have seen again a, a year uh, for people of African descent, this with the aim that uh, to realize the political will to implement the DDPA. And still we have seen that if you look at the world, if you're global, even in the CARICOM countries, we have seen that still the DDPA wasn't impl implemented. So then a, a, a decade was needed to realize this. We have seen that the decade, in fact, should, should, uh, should uh, go in uh, 2013, but because the, the European countries and their allies were against, and it was because of the G77 that adopted the uh, uh, that has the majority to adopt by consensus this uh, this international decade for people of African descent, and I agree with everybody because if I go through all what all the activities that has been uh, realized, I have count more than hundred sessions on UN mechanism level. Uh, uh, sessions outside of, uh, uh, within the African Union structure, the, U the European structure Car uh, in the Caribbean. If I put all these sessions together and all the resolutions and all the declarations, and even on the European Union level, parliament level, we have seen 2019, 2020, because of the, of the killing of, of uh, of uh, George Floyd, we have seen today, let me take a, a last year, 20 years after the Durban Declaration, that nothing, that, that 
again uh, the European Union and their allies, the USA, UK in front, for instance, were against to, uh, to commemorate this 20 years adoption. But we must know that the decade for people of African descent is not uh, because of the decade itself. No, it is because as a, uh, as a, as a, as a instrument to realize the political will to, to implement the DDPA, to, to adopt a second, uh, a, second, uh, 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 a second decade. That is also what we put on the agenda of the forum, because I think that the forum is very important for three things. The one is the, uh, the, the, the implementation of the Durban de Declaration and Program of Action. That must be the basis of the work of the, of, the, of the forum. The UN decade for people of African descent, because it is in that uh, instrument that the forum was uh, adopted as a part of the development, as a part of uh, human rights and, uh, and, and the freedom of African people. So you cannot have a forum if these two uh, these two uh, mechanisms are not, uh, can I say mechanism, these two declarations are not in the front, uh, in, in, in the first articles. So that the European Union and their allies, they want to keep anti-Black racism. And anti-Black racism in their declaration, because it is very important to go to the last, and you will see that anti-Black uh, racism it's a term that has adopted uh, has adopted after after negrophobia because negrophobia was a term that they were using, but because negrophobia is a uh, is uh, they consider it as a racism, you know, neger nigger, they uh, they they change it in uh, they adopt uh, anti-black racism, but anti-black racism is also used for for racism against uh, uh, all kinds of, uh, of, of people, for Chinese, from India, if, for the third, for the Commission on the Elimination of Racial and Discrimination, from the several nations, kingdoms, then you will see that under anti-Semitism, you have anti-Semitism, you have Romas and Essentis, and you have anti-Black racism, and then you see, a lot of, uh, oh yeah, you have Muslim phobia or Islam phobia, you have e even homophobia and all this, the, the kind of phobias, and you have anti-Black racism, and under anti-Black racism, you will notice that various kind of racism, but when you use the specific term of, fo of forms of multiple racism, and you use Afrophobia, it cannot be so that they will not take in consideration the racism that was developed to legitimize the, the, the slavery on African people. Because it was that racism that still continues and, and, and used to marginalize African people. A second decade did this not give us the guarantee that in that second decade they will they will uh, integrate the, the the DDPA. So we have to be very 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 uh, uh, conscient uh, about the documents. And uh, so, Chairman, uh, if you ask me the, about the process, I'm very obsessed. I'm very obsessed to get the Africa to get the DDPA implemented. Because it's in the, in the DDPA we have, for instance, from Article 158 until I think 165, we have issues uh, like uh, 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 reparations, uh, like apology, uh, some very key. Uh, like, for instance, the return of, 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 of goods, of stolen, stolen artifacts. artifacts. Uh, we have in the DDPA, we have all these actions that has to be taken 
by the by governments, by nation state, and especially the nation state that are uh, that are uh, how you say it? the nation states that committed these crimes against uh, 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 humanity uh, in connection with the transatlantic slave trade. You know, Article thirteen thirteen in the DDPA, whereby uh, this uh, this horrors has uh, declared as a crime against humanity. So we have all this in the DDPA. That's why it was very important that in 2009, in Artic Article 3Q, we have confirmed. What we also have in the there is these are articles and paragraphs that gives uh, that gives direction to, for instance, the African Union. Uh, uh, on the right to return of African people, the right to return of African people. So it is very important that we, beside the 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 the, the case of people of African descent, that we also look at the DDPA because if we don't make sure that the DDPA will be a part of the new of the of the of the extension of the the the, the new uh, the second second decade we are lost forever is to me very Yes, I have been at this. And in 2001, when we had the World Conference, by consensus, chattel enslavement and colonization were crimes against humanity. NGO sector in Barbados that went to successful conference in Durban, Barbados conference in 2002. Out of that conference in 2002, I went to, and at the Geneva conference, activities for 2011, which the working group of experts has de had declared as the International Year for People of African Descent, is not a single CARICOM or Caribbean country was at that meeting. And before the working group opened the meeting, they said what we would also like to do is have an international day for people of African descent. And while we were, let's say, a date was put forward by a former member of the experts on people of African descent. Only the one that the Barbados delegation put forward. So the whole idea of an international day was someone from Africa, a representative, said that what we should also have is a decade for people of African descent, because that was not on the agenda in 2010. What happened is trying to discuss, beat them at their game. The system is based on two things, the law, the system is based on the legal, which is the common law. They said that slavery was legal. From the time the UN, colonialism, crimes against humanity, based on, and we would, we would have been miles ahead now. We should be asking for reparations for crimes against humanity. And that is my contribution to you all.
Good afternoon. My name is Elsie Gale. I am a practicing midwife in the United Kingdom. I also have extensive midwifery and nursing practice across the diaspora, having worked in countries of the South, following my excellent training in nursing and midwifery in the United Kingdom. I'm on my way to Geneva because I think the issues for maternal and child health in our communities across the diaspora are critically important to our health and well-being and our sustainable, um, well-living lives into the future. So this is only a part of the presentation that I will be making to the um, forum as time goes on. This is about understanding childbirth within the diaspora, particularly in the UK, because this is where my main practice is. And I'm looking today at the personal and collective journeys to how it is that we repair our reproductive health and well-being in the diaspora, across the diaspora, based in the United Kingdom experience. So this is me and my colleague. We came together to set up a small independent practice focused on cultural safe care for black women, for midwives and their babies and the families in the communities. We have been doing quite a lot of work. So for example, we inaugurated the um, all party parliamentary group for black maternal health in the United Kingdom having taken a vote in Parliament week in 2019. We've also been very successful in achieving uh, funding to set the first Black Reproductive Conference in 2019. And we have been part of a whistleblowing pilot in the NHS, which actually allows people who have concerns to raise them safely within healthcare. We practice in Birmingham because Birmingham is uh, an area where disparities are huge and there's a lot of issues for women of African descent. In the United Kingdom then, what we have seen over a number of years is the fact that there is a huge disparity between black women and women who are of white European descent. One of the um, anomalies here is the fact that if you look very closely at women who are black and who are mixed race, if you combine those two figures, what you will see is that there is an enormous disparity. So for example, there are people like myself who are of mixed race, but who identify as black. And we think that these things are really important when we look at data. You know, We need to have accurate data so that we can actually understand what is going on for our communities. This is the model that we've developed over time. We've had a bit of funding here and there. We've spent a lot of volunteer time to develop the practice that we know will make a difference for women of the diaspora. The focus that we have is the Sankofa bird. So reproductive Sankofa, we call it. And basically it is so that we can go back to have a really good look at what the issues are for us using the lens of the black woman, black families and black midwives in order that we can find the way to go forward to repair our issues. What is at risk? Well, our mothers, our babies and ultimately our communities within the diaspora. What we find then is that we have really great policies but actually bringing the policies into practice is hugely difficult. There is a complex um, issue in terms of how maternity services work and then how race and gender come together to impact on a negative scale, our communities. Okay, thank you. I know Sister Elsie's in the room. I don't want her to retread what she has because she spoke at a very measured pace and she was quite clear. But probably one question I'd like you to answer, Sister Elsie, uh, you are in Geneva, I do believe. What is your overarching uh, aim in terms of uh, what you want to achieve uh, whilst you're in Geneva? So can you just respond to that specific question, Sister Elsie? Okay, thank you very much. And 
I want to continue the work that Global African Congress UK has supported me with to embed a work stream at the permanent forum specifically to deal with maternity for our people. It is critically important that we do something at the root because that will make a hell of a lot of difference, profound difference now and in the future. Uh, my place of birth is the Cameroons, the Southern Cameroons, to be very precise, in Bamenda, in a town called Bamenda. So that's where I was born. And um, I was the, uh, vice, the vice president of the Trade Union Confederation in Cameroon, uh, 2006, uh, uh, <clears throat> some time ago. And um, I'm out in exile because of the conflict in the Cameroon. That's where I am in exile now in Nigeria. There is a genocide going on in the Southern Cameroon that has taken the lives of more than 45,000 people, including women and children. Uh, many homes, about 500 villages have been burned down. We have in Nigeria more than 200,000 refugees, as I speak to you, are in Nigeria and in various refugee camps. Some are actually uh, suffered mental issues because of the situation, their livelihoods have been taken away from them. And uh, uh, where I am right now, speaking in the conference, I came to visit some families, about 33 of them that are in a particular refugee uh, camp, that uh, in a particular refugee accommodation, 10 of them are mentally sick and they, are, they have been sleeping on the floor for the past five years on the bare floor. I think the members of the GAC, uh, I sub sent some of some images to them to see the situation and I trying to see how I can call for assistance to give to them. You see all women and children, I mean, and they have other further people in the hospitals that have been shot for some at the leg, some at other parts of the body. They are currently in the hospitals. Some of them have died, of course, through the process, but I'm talking of currently the ones that are in the hospital that we're trying to raise also funds to try to support their medical bills and all of that. So, but my, my, the issue is, I am very happy about this conference. And I'm very happy that the African people are coming together because it is the only way through which we as a people can also assert ourselves those values that humanity deserves. We have a culture of Ubuntu. We have, uh, 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 we have resources. We have so many things that if we as a people can come together, we can mobilize our resources, both uh, intellectual and financial and otherwise to stop what is happening to us because we are late in doing this. Yes, uh, I want to say that as far as the decade is concerned for the African people, the governments are eloquent. They don't, they don't, they have never even make the people to understand that this is what is, these opportunities are available for them to, you know, emancipate themselves or for them to be able to use the platform to present their their situation. So as far as the decade is concerned, most and most African leaders are neo-colonialists, just to remind those who are talking about how African leaders, it is the people of Africa that can bring the change in Africa and not the government as it speaks. So as we gather here, I am very certain that positive things will start happening, beginning from making the atmosphere conducive for economic development for the well-being of our people. I'm based largely in the Caribbean in Barbados, but I also am um, in the UK because that's where I was raised, that's where my family often are. My activism is global in that 
uh, I am part of uh, a movement and organizations that have uh, members on the continent of Africa in different countries and in Europe and so on and so forth. So I work to keep myself informed and, um, and uh, contribute in the ways that I can. I'm a researcher, I'm an educator, but I'm also a mother, a grandmother, a sister, uh, and I say all those things because of the importance of personhood in this work. Um, eight of the ten years have already gone, and we're speaking of um, getting another ten. I think we should work to get as much time as we can, but we do not have the luxury of time. Many of us are fighting individually um, for things that have happened to us in the education system or the schooling system, in uh, other social contexts, so medically, um, just in lots of different ways. And the trauma that we sometimes call post-trauma is not post anything, it is enduring, it is current. So I think out of the two things, it would be around the healing program and in terms of our education that we not only speak of our history and the other things we have spoken about, you know, um, in terms of intangible heritage and so on and so forth, but that our education should not just be about the past, it should be about the present and it should be about the future because many of us are growing up uh, disconnected from ourselves, disconnected from our African cultural um, uh, retentions and so on and so forth and because we don't know them we are not as strong, we are not as focused, we are not unapologetic. So for me those are the two things. Okay. Education and the healing. I know in the introductions, people are saying they're here to learn. I do hope you learned something. Certainly, it's been a learning this, uh, uh, space for me. It's been a learning space, and I'm very sure it must have been for you. We had a couple of people that didn't get to talk, but uh, that's Brother Andrew and Brother uh, Glenroy. But nevertheless, they were in the room, so it's not just about presenting, but also listening to what other people had to say. So I'm sure they would have had a learning experience. And the conversation is not just here, the conversation is going to continue el elsewhere. Other organizations are doing similar work. So that conversation and also the practicals from that conversation needs to be- Don't get only one for a coffee, she's back. Um, actually, um, it was very interesting what I heard today and I, I had the thought while I was listening. And despite the fact that I'm doing as many, um, well, let's say events, you know, as I can, I haven't come across it. So there is one organization, um, they kind of, well, let, let's say one or two, they kind of have it on the agenda, but I haven't seen um, events and let's say online events, especially that included that as a title. So it, that also made me think. So, you know, when we heard we only have two years left and I kind of know about it because um, we have um, one in Berlin, it's called Each One um, Teach One. So they are more in the library and uh, research. So they have mentioned that as well. Uh, and another one as well, but I, it's not as present as it could be or even should be. So I'm grateful to what I heard today um, because yes, I've been following you for a while. And uh, so hopefully next year we can also kind of like uh, make our initiative a bit more uh, uh, strong. So I'm here with a sister and from next year on we can, um, well, we, we, we plan to start to be a bit more structured um, that I can also use that input I'm, I'm receiving uh, also from you and uh, all the, the great speakers here. And yeah, uh, yeah, it's only two years left from what we have now. I mean, it would be great if uh, everything would be extended, but that's what we don't have in hand yet. But so we still have two years. So um, yeah, I think we can also um, do some work here in Germany and I'm yeah grateful to listen to you and I'm happy to do what I can.
Greetings, my name is Glenroy Watson. I am the Secretary of the Global African Congress UK chapter, but also I'm a Pan-Africanist trade union on London Underground. We have tried to contribute and continue to contribute around the work around the decade, indeed uh, assisting in the development of the UK uh, effort around the decade. But it has to be recognised that the fact that the UK government decided at the outset that it would give no assistance and no help in recognising the decade has proven to be problematic. So more trade union effort is needed to make this, what has been a short period, effective. And we need to remember that Nelson Mandela recognize that it will take much more than a decade, in fact a century, to roll back what has been done to the African people. So a decade has not been sufficient. But for the remaining two years, trade unionists need to add their support and help towards making what is the start of a process around recognition, justice, and development. So I invite you to join in with the remaining time of the decade to demand longer for this objective to be achieved. Thank you. Mm -hmm.